All right, uh, hi everyone. Um, welcome back. I've started the recording um, and I'm gonna pin Alyssa. Uh, Avi's having a little bit of difficulty logging in, but we're working on it. So if I happen to go on mute just for a moment, um, that's because I'm trying to help him uh, get on. Uh, but what we'll do is we'll start with Alyssa and I will just ask, um, you know, Alyssa to say five to 10 minutes, maybe a little longer if you wish, uh, about your job, uh, what the day-to-day -day life is like, what the year-to-year -year life is like, um, how you sort of got into this, uh, into this job, sort of the, the choices that you made uh, along the way and, you know, what's, what's good and bad about it. So with that, I'll just turn it over to you, Alyssa, and let me, let me pin you first. Good morning, can you hear me? And go ahead, yeah, we can hear you. All right, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for having me. Thank you, Professor Dodson. I am Elisa Victory. I graduated from Hastings in 2016. I'm from Oakland. I'm still a resident of Oakland, and I like to represent my city with everything I do. Um, I'm currently a staff attorney at ACLU Northern California at their SF office, even though we've been on shelter in place for a while now. Um, I work in their criminal justice program doing police practices, and I'm also part of our statewide police practices team. Um, I'll talk a little bit about my journey to get here first, and then I'll come back to what my day-to-day -day kind of look like and the good and bad. Um, I am a first-generation college student. I'm a first-generation law student. I went to UC San Diego for undergrad and I was doing a lot of community organizing before I went to college. I ended up studying ethnic studies at UC San Diego and had a minor in black studies. Um, so I was doing a lot of racial justice organizing, student organizing on campus and off campus. And I eventually did an honors thesis that was about police brutality in the black community. Um, and this was you know, over 10 years ago. I was studying this issue and I was reading reports from the 60s and 70s about this issue and became really interested in law just by reading the cases, um, reading the DA's reports about the investigations. And that was my first time really touching legal materials and understanding the laws that empower police and the laws that are supposed to protect us as civilians. So I was really motivated to go to law school to learn more and wanted to do criminal justice initially. But I got a lot sidetracked while I was at Hastings. Um, I fell in love with government law. I concentrated in government while I was at Hastings. But I also did a lot of labor and employment. My first summer, I was working at a police brutality a civil rights firm, bringing civil suits for families and victims of police violence. And they had one attorney in that office who was also doing sexual harassment claims in the workplace. I had no idea that sexual harassment was part of employment law and employment discrimination. And I used to do sexual violence work in my undergraduate work. So I really liked just interviewing clients and getting the story and the facts to be able to give to the attorney um, to recommend whether he take the case or not. And so I started taking employment law classes I was chair of the Labor and Employment Student Association at Hastings. Um, I also led the Black Law Students Association at Hastings and was a member of almost all the other minority associations there. Um, so I you know, got sidetracked from criminal justice for a while. Actually, I, when I graduated, I passed the bar and um, became the law fellow for the California Employment Lawyers Association which does only plaintiff side work and represents workers. Um, I was placed at Legal Aid at Work, which is a nonprofit and doing mostly wage theft and race discrimination cases. And then I went to Feinberg Jackson Worthman and Wausau, which is a small private firm in the East Bay. They're in Berkeley now. They're doing ERISA, which uh, you know, ERISA is very technical. It's statutory law, it's mostly federal cases. Um, but it's employee retirement benefits. And so it was still a part of labor and employment law that I got to learn from some of the experts. I found that it's not my cup of tea and it was still a great experience um, working at that firm. And they also had some civil rights litigation going on against Medi-Cal, um, against the state's Medi-Cal program for not providing adequate healthcare access. And you know this was before COVID even hit. So, um, I've 
you know, took a lot of different turns just in my first few years out of law school. I ended up at a private firm in Hayward doing employment discrimination with my mentor, Niall Benjamin, who is actually a Hastings alumni as well. And I worked there for two years. It was very trial heavy. I was in court almost every day, um, mostly in Alameda County and SF County doing housing cases, but also a lot of employment discrimination and wage theft cases. And I've been at ACLU for a year now. Um, so I found myself teaching at San Quentin Prison and doing a lot of criminal justice work outside of my employment job. So I decided to switch jobs to be more criminal justice focused. So that's how I made the decision to leave um, private employment practice. And now I'm at ACLU, which is a nonprofit. Um, we have different affiliates. We have national and each state has their own separate affiliates as well. Um, I do police practices work, which you know has been in the huge forefront of local news, of demonstrations in the street, especially over the last year, but it has been going on for some years now. So a lot of the work that I do in my day-to-day -day at ACLU is more legal policy and advising. I've helped to revise city departments' use of force policies for their police departments, help advise community groups on creating police oversight bodies like police commissions or citizen review boards. Um, I also advise city council members or mayors or other government officials who might want to do these things themselves or how to strengthen the oversight or the accountability of the police. Um, there's a lot of cities and jurisdictions who wanna defund the police. And they've also asked for our office's advice on what legal issues that raises in terms of police officers' union rights and union contracts that are already in place. And so I'm able to still combine a lot of my labor and employment background with my policing work now. Um, we also, ACLU works in just a lot of different types of advocacy. So we do grassroots organizing and help support groups on the ground. Um, we'll fund you know, community gatherings. We'll do trainings of how to call into your city council or how to write a resolution. And we also have a legislative side that helps champion you know, police reform bills at the state level, things like Assembly Bill 392, which changed the use of force standard for deadly force statewide for all law enforcement agencies. Also a lot of police transparency laws about access to records. Um, we also just give a lot of talks and community education about what, you know, what powers police have, what powers citizens have to oversee them or to curtail their power. So that's my day to day looks kind of different all the time. It's a lot of calls. It's a lot of reviewing policies and providing edits and feedback. But it could also be working with community partners before COVID. It was attending demonstrations or doing press conferences with our partners. Um, so really supporting the movements on the ground by adding ACLU's voice and our expertise. Um, I'm also now interim taking charge of all of our litigation for the criminal justice team. And most of those are related to Public Records Act requests for things like peace officer records or a use of force incident. And many police departments and cities do not want to give up those records, even though the law changed two years ago to allow the public to see those for families to get those records to help with their cases sometimes. Um, so that's some of the litigation work that I've been doing more recently this year. Um, so I'll stop there and give it back to you, Professor. Okay, thank you so much, Alyssa. Um, we will, I'll, I'll follow up with some questions, but first let's, let's hear from Avi. Hi, everybody. Uh, thanks for having me. Uh, my name is Avi Carr. Um, I'm an attorney with the Natural Resources Defense Council, and I'll start with uh, talking about where I am right now, what NRDC does, and then I can work backwards to how I got here. Um, so I've been at NRDC for about 13 years now, um, and uh, I am playing a several different roles at the moment at NRDC. Um, uh, I am directing our state health policy work, which basically focuses on three different states at the moment, uh, California, New York, and Maryland. And I, when I talk about health policy, I'm talking about policies related to toxic chemicals primarily. Um, 
and regulating their use so that we're protecting for the adverse health impacts that are often associated with those chemicals. Um, uh, I've been, I'm also stepped into a, on an interim basis, uh, directing our health and food work. Uh, so NRDC has four different programs uh, within the organization. There's nature, there's climate and clean energy, um, there's international, and then there's people and communities, which is where we are located. And people and communities has several different branches of work, um, one of which is health and food, and uh, I'm helping on an interim basis uh, with the management of that particular set of work. My work is primarily legislative at this point in time and to a certain degree administrative in this new capacity. Um, and again, the, the you know my focus is on toxic chemicals and on um, the food and agriculture system. Uh, so adverse health impacts, pollution, um, adverse impacts in general associated with those two categories of work. Um, let's see, NRDC, as I mentioned, has got all these different areas of work. We're a pretty large organization. We are about 700 odd people, um, one of the largest environmental nonprofits in the country, and we cover a huge diversity of environmental issues. So we, for instance, uh, work on climate and clean energy, which is to be expected for a large environmental organization, but lots of issues related to um, the natural world. So whether it's endangered species or protecting rivers or national monuments, all those kinds of things. Um, we also do international work. We have an office in Beijing. We uh, have some work in India and Latin America. Um, and then, uh, you know, there's a bunch of different work being done in those areas, including both climate work as well as work on nature related issues. And then we have work around um, what we term people and communities, which can range from uh, energy efficiency and equity focused work in cities and regions to uh, health related work like ours to the environmental justice team at, at, within our group um, to work that is focused on the city of New York, for instance. So there's a wide range of work that is being covered in this uh, within these umbrellas. Uh, we, in addition to our specific subject matter areas, NRDC also has teams dedicated to working on things like litigation. So uh, I am not doing a whole lot of litigation myself, although many program attorneys, people who are working within these different programs outline do do litigation work. Um, but our litigation team is available to work with our program attorneys to do the litigation that we do. And we do a lot of it. We sued uh, the Trump administration multiple, multiple times during the four years, I mean, hundreds of times <laughs> during the four years of that administration. Um, we also have dedicated uh, communication staff, fundraising staff, uh, political staff that help us negotiate the legislative um, corridors in various states and of course at the federal level. So that's the environment or the context in which I work. And as I said, a lot of my work is policy focused. So I've been working on legislation in California since um, probably 2009 or so. Uh, and then we, in the last few years, we've started to branch out to do toxics policy work, primarily legislative in places like New York and Maryland. A lot of our thinking is that, you know, especially when it comes to toxics and consumer products, which is where a lot of our focus is. Um, if you can regulate products in places like California and New York, which are huge markets, then you can affect the national market effect effectively. In some cases you're creating examples and that example can lead to other states um, doing work uh, or passing legislation or passing laws or taking action that reflects what's happened in the lead states uh, and eventually hopefully federal action. But in many cases, the action in places like California and New York can have direct impacts on the national marketplace because of the size and heft of those marketplaces, of, of, of those states' markets. Um, so I'll give you some examples of that kind of work. Um, and then I, I'll go back in time and talk about my journey here. Uh, so uh, last year, we passed a bill in California that bans the use of what are known as PFAS chemicals. These are forever chemicals persistent. They do not break down easily in the environment. They're around for a very long time and they're ubiquitous. They're about, um, to date, it's estimated about 9,000 plus chemicals in the class of PFAS chemicals um, associated with a whole range of 
uh, health effects. This is what is found in Teflon. This is the same chemical. It was the chemical featured in Dark Waters, uh, the movie. And um, it's everywhere. It's, it's been used in lots and lots of stuff. It's being found in drinking water across the country. So we are trying to ensure that uh, we get rid of unnecessary uses of this chemical. And one of the places we decided to focus was the use of these PFAS chemicals in firefighting foam, uh, firefighting foam that is used for liquid uh, fires based from gasoline or petroleum or sources like that. And, you know, lots of countries have now begun to move away. Australia has banned this already. Um, and then lots of airports around the world have also moved away, including Heathrow, have moved away from firefighting foam containing PFAS. So last year, and, and a bunch of other states that already passed bans, Washington, uh, New York, had passed bans on continued sales of this kind of foam. Last year, we passed a ban in California that takes this further. It not only bans the sale of these uh, firefighting foams with PFAS in them, it bans um, the use of them too after a certain date. And it phases in that, um, that ban over time for different uses. So for instance, at the refineries, the oil refineries, they're allowed to use it until 2028 under strict criteria um, for containment and for reporting and um, then have a waiver process if, if alternatives are not in use at other refineries elsewhere. So there, we're, this, is a, this is an example of what I mentioned where you pass state legislation that sets up uh, precedent for other states to follow and hopefully for eventual federal adoption. In another case, uh, you know, a few years ago, we passed legislation banning toxic flame retardant chemicals, which were added to things like furniture. Um, in pounds. <laughs> and they weren't very effective at preventing fires, but they were exposing all of us to chemicals that put us all at risk of various adverse health effects. Um, so California a few years ago banned um, the use of these flame retardant chemicals in furniture, in mattress foam, in certain children's products because they're not necessary and weren't effective at preventing fires. Because California actually adopted a another flammability standard that provided for fire safety without the use of these chemicals. And just last year, as part of the um, final omnibus bill that passed at the end of the year federally, that California standard, that flammability standard that provides fire safety without toxic chemicals was adopted as the national standard as part of that, uh, of that law. So that's, you can see two different things at play there. One, California law acting as the precedent for what happens federally. But secondly, when, when that law a banning flame retardant chemicals and furniture, et cetera, passed in California, it effectively effect, uh, it regulated a large portion of the national marketplace. We're still trying to pass those laws in various states to, to close the gap on any regional manufacturing and sales that may be happening, which might be causing exposure in different regions. So for instance, we're pursuing a similar legislation in New York this year, but for the large national manufacturers uh, that are selling at places like Crate and Barrel or Ikea or whatever, you know, the ban in California effectively affects the national marketplace. And so that's really powerful. So that's just to give you a couple of examples of the kind of work that we do and the kind of impact it can have. We continue to do work around litigation as well. We're, I'm working right now, for instance, on uh, Prop 65 related issues where we will likely do a friend of the uh, court brief uh, related, to, related to that. Um, we also continue to do administrative advocacy where we uh, submit comments on rulemaking proposals or guidance proposals from agencies, both at the state and federal level, um, to ensure that laws are implemented strongly and health protectively. Um, so that's just to give you a brief sort of taste of the kinds of pieces of work that are involved in what we do. The day-to-day -day work looks not uh, very similar to what you described earlier. It's a lot of calls. Uh, it's a lot of uh, reviewing and uh, evaluating policy. It's drafting at times. You know, when you work on legislation, you have to constantly look at language. You're involved in negotiations with the other side. You're collaborating in co coalitions with partners. And we work, especially in the toxics world, we often work in collaboration. So bills we work on, um, you may be familiar with this. In California, there's what's known as a sponsorship session. So an, you have an author on a bill, which is a legislator, and then you have organizations that are sponsors that are basically the main proponents of a bill and take the lead in developing language and getting support for the bill and so on. And on, um, on toxics uh, uh, related bills, 
there's usually four or five co-sponsors who've often worked in concert with other organizations in moving legislation forward. So for instance, the flame retardant bill we worked with, and, with, and the, actually the fire, uh, firefighting phone bill, we worked with California professional firefighters, we worked with Clean Water Action, we worked with uh, environmental working group and um, breast cancer prevention partners. So th there's a lot of co coalition work involved. There's a lot of work negotiating with the opposition. Um, and there's a lot of time spent in internal calls and conversation getting uh, a strategy figured out and, um, and uh, developing the work. So um, days are spent a lot on email, on, uh, on the computer, on video calls, uh, doing review and drafting material and writing often short things, you know, blogs, uh, explanations, fact sheets, um, and in many cases, legislative language. Um, uh, so that's the kind of work that I do. How I got here, uh, I'll try to keep this brief. I, I've been doing this for 13 years. And I, you know, once I got to NRDC, uh, my work has evolved, even though I've been here. I mean, I started off doing Clean Air Act litigation um, at NRDC when I first arrived here um, and uh, doing a lot of administrative advocacy. And over time, it has shifted further and further towards legislative advocacy and policy advocacy as I go on. The... Um, my path, I mean, I, I, I came to the States when I was 15, um, went to high school uh, in, on the East Coast and went to college not knowing exactly what I wanted to do, came out with an English uh, degree. Uh, I, I, I didn't really know what I was going to do, thought maybe I was going to be a writer. I ended up working in the business world for three years before um, coming to NRDC as an administrative assistant, assistant and figuring out that this is what I wanted to do, work in the environmental space. Um, I really wanted to engage in an analytical manner and I wanted to engage on things that mattered to me. Spending time doing work, uh, or before, before I went to NRDC to do this administrative work where I was basically an administrative assistant, um, I had been working, I had worked in the management consulting world coming right out of college for a year and I worked in the advertising world for two years. And what I discovered was that, you know, sometimes the work was engaging, the nature of the work was sometimes engaging, but overall I needed a more of a connection to the work um, that if I was gonna spend all that time doing something, I wanted to care about it in a different way. And that's what led me to NRDC as a, uh, to, in that administrative capacity and then eventually to law school to pursue environmental work. Um, I went to Hastings um, and when I came out, um, I got a fellowship uh, which was offered through Hastings, actually to Hastings students to go work at the Center on Race Poverty in the Environment, where I was a fellow uh, for a year and then a staff attorney for a year doing Clean Air Act litigation, suing uh, mega dairies in the um, Central Valley that were violating air pollution requirements. And eventually that create, you know, opened an opportunity at NRDC with the health program and the transition for the environmental justice work to health focused works um, is a fairly self-explanatory tra uh, trajectory. Um, you know, I think one of the things that appealed to me about coming to NRDC was the um, ability to work at the policy scale in a broader way and to address a broader range of issues and um, what still have a connection to the EJ work that I started off with coming out of uh, law school. Now, I didn't intend to get into EJ work. Uh, not that I, I always known about it and it was always something uh, I thought was important, but I'd been looking more broadly the environmental sphere. Um, it was a bit of luck and um, fortune in a way. Uh, you know, I, I had a friend who worked at CRPE during doing summer work. They told me they were looking some, for somebody to apply for the fellowship. I ended up meeting with the um, founder and then executive director of CRPE, uh, Luke Cole, um, and ended up applying for that fellowship and getting it. Um, and Luke ended up becoming a mentor and close friend before he passed away. Um, that was a wonderful experience. One of the things about working at a place like CRPE is you do everything from stapling your own stuff to writing your own briefs and arguing them in court. And it was invaluable experience in that regard. And I had a really wonderful experience there for two years. And they continue to do fantastic work. You should check them out if you get the opportunity. Uh, and then, um, you know, so that, that's, that's sort of how I ended up in environmental justice and then eventually to the kind of health work that I do now, environmental health work that I do now. Um, the other thing to mention about what I did in law school that might, you know, tell you how I approach this. I, I came to law school with a very specific thing in mind. I wanted to be in the environmental space. I took every environmental class I could. 
uh, including things like administrative law, which have a pretty big uh, role to play in environmental issues. Uh, I was a part of uh, the Hastings Public Interest Law Foundation. I joined the Environmental Law Society. I um, was on the West Northwest Journal and ran that my final year. Um, I also did all my summer and externship opportunities were environmentally oriented. So I um, first summer I went back to NRDC as a summer intern. Um, uh, second summer I was at Shoot Mihaly and Weinberger, which is a plaintiff side small law firm uh, doing environmental work. Um, and then for my externship, I took the environmental um, clinic and I did that at EPA Region 9. So my thought was to get a perspective from the nonprofit sector, the private sector, at least the private sector I was willing to consider. I didn't want to go to a law firm. I was pretty clear on that. Uh, and then uh, it also at the government uh, sort of angle. And then I did a judicial externship my last year as well, just to get a yet another perspective on how all these things work. Um, I, I, I would encourage you to take every opportunity you can to get that practical experience. I think it tells you a lot about what you will like and what you won't and what will work for you and what's attractive to you. Uh, and all that helped me make the choices I did as I went along the way. But I've spoken a lot. Let me just stop there and uh, turn it back to you, Scott, and we can get into questions. Sure. Thanks so much, Avi. That was great. Um, I'd love to know sort of what, um, you know, what kind of skills are really good for the kind of work that you're doing. Uh, lawyer skills are pretty broad, but um, and each kind of litigation practice or, or lobbying practice, as, as you may have now, uh, demand different sets of skills. So I'd love to hear the kind of skills that uh, would be right for the a job like you're holding now. And, and maybe Alyssa, you could start us off. Great question. Um, you know, before you know, juxtaposed to my private firm job, it was a lot of just writing, research writing, writing briefs, preparing oppositions, reviewing the opposing sides briefs and their motions, and you know, being ready and preparing for hearings. So it was very research intensive, writing intensive, and then being prepared to communicate that in court. But with ACLU, it's yeah, more policy advocacy, and even our litigation is more impact litigation. So it is writing, but it's you know different. It's like demand letter type of writing. It's communication and correspondence to police departments or to city governments. Um, we also have, again have a lot of meetings with partners or with community groups or with legislators. So having strong you know, verbal skills, being able to communicate orally and being able to like translate maybe complicated legal concepts and to you know, plain terms into everyday people's talk where people can see themselves and understand how this applies to their life or why this police oversight is so important and to not always talk about it so technically or legally. So I think strong verbal communication skills and you know being personable with folks and dealing with different personalities and different people's interests. Um, you know, we have to juggle that a lot at ACLU. Um, it's just competing groups. Sometimes we represent two groups that have different missions, but they're still protecting something like free speech at the end of the day. Um, so I still think writing, but writing more for a public audience, for a government audience. And again, oral skills to be able to communicate with partners, with impacted people, with community groups who may know nothing about the law or not how to even read it. Thank you. Uh, Avi, anything to add? I think all of those things are true for me as well. I think that that's a large part of what's called for, the ability to communicate to the public, but also legislators, you know, um, they, you have to be able to explain your stuff in a way that is comprehensible and straightforward and is not overly, the, the, the right level of detail, let's put it that way. Sometimes you need to get into more detail, sometimes less. The other thing that's important from, in our work is the ability to engage with the science because we work with, we have scientists on staff and we work with them very closely, but it's to be able to onboard that, synthesize it and be able to explain it and talk about it in a 
uh, persuasively in the um, legislative environment or in negotiations or wherever the case may be. Um, so there's a lot of uh, public writing in addition to the kinds of things Alyssa mentioned. I also do a lot of blogging. And so there's that kind of communication, fact sheets, shorter pieces, generally speaking. Um, there's also, you know, occasionally you have to communicate with reporters. You have to be able to figure that out and boil things down to the basics a lot of the time. Uh, while in being able to engage with the details and understand the nuances, because if you're in a negotiation with the opposing side or legislation, is just the top line isn't going to be enough most of the time. You also need to understand the detail behind it. So it's that combination of understanding the detail, but being able to express it at the appropriate level of generality for the appropriate audience. Um, and finally, the last thing I'll add, and I think. Uh, Alyssa alluded to this as well. And in policy work, you also have to look at the language. You have to be able to read, assess, and synthesize very quickly what's going on, because often you don't have a whole lot of time to look at a, something and decide whether you want to support it, whether something needs to change, what needs to change, et cetera. So it, it comes with experience. You figure out like what you need to look for and how to do it and to draft quickly, simply, as much as possible. Uh, to address the gaps. And then also the strategic sensibility to understand what is being tried, where things might go, where you might want to start, where you might want to end up with all of that. You know, you have to play that strategic game of figuring out where you're trying to get and where you need to start and what the pushback is going to be and to anticipate all that. So to be able to sort of think ahead and plan for that. Yeah, I'd like to follow up on that. Um... It sounds like you know you, you've got an agenda, right? And you're trying to push the agenda on multiple fronts, um, and so that demands um, some strategy, some long-term thinking, and some short-term thinking. Uh, coalition building, working with partners. Um, how much of you know your job is really thinking about you know, your long-term goals and trying to put yourself on the right in, and your organization on the right path to achieve them? Avi. Um. I think that's a significant part of what we do. We periodically reassess where we are. I mean, as we are, we work in teams and our teams constantly are fine tuning, uh, but you know, at least once a year, we're looking at a strategy and trying to figure out where we're headed, making plans for what's coming next, what we're gonna take on this particular year, maybe in the next six months, depending on what's going on. And it's a process of calibration. So you've got, you know, it's a calibration of the short term, it's a calibration of the mid medium term and the long term, because you've got long term strategies of trying to get certain put harmful chemicals out or end certain harmful practices. But you've also got medium term goals of moving this particular piece of legislation, uh, convincing a particular uh, corporate entity to change its practices, uh, or pursuing a particular piece of legislation, I mean, sorry, litigation. So any of those could be happening, right? And then you might get something new happens, something comes in the news, something new shows up and you have to calibrate for that. So I think it's a, it's a iterative process. I don't think it's a, it's a you know, um, cut and dried in that sense. Yeah. Alyssa, how about you? How does strategy play in? Yeah, I think uh, it's important to have a strategy to know the bigger picture, especially with ACLU, we get so many requests to sign on to things or to partner to show up to be a part of some campaign and we don't have the capacity to, you know, jump into every single thing we're asked to do. So having some guiding points for us and for staff helps us assess, you know, what priorities we want to really take on or make room to do what things we need to refer to our partners or to other organizations that might have more space at that time. We do do yearly planning. Um, we have you know, individual departments, like there's the immigration team that's separate from the criminal justice team. We also talk across teams. Um, we have a lot of meetings um, internally because there's so much internal structuring that is kind of you know, there's a lot of different working groups and lots of overlap. So there's a lot of meetings where we're constantly checking in about where we're at, where we're progressing, if this is meeting our, you know, main goals or if we need to set new goals. It, um, similar to what Avi said, we do have to always have some space for things that just come up, things that are emergencies. One example is COVID. Um, during the pandemic in March, um, we immediately had to shift gear to try to do emergency requests to release people from jails um, because it's hard to socially distance when you are incarcerated. 
right? They were not being provided with PPE or testing or anything like that. And there were really high rates of folks incarcerated contracting it, especially from the guards who were the ones actually going and coming in and out of the facilities. And jails, folks who are in jail, many of them are there pre-trial. They've not been convicted of anything, right? Many of them can't afford bail or are there for other reasons. So we had to shift just to respond to this national emergency and to not want folks to unreasonably be exposed to a pandemic while they're incarcerated and not able to protect themselves and folks who may not even be convicted of anything unnecessary to be there. So that's one example where we had to shift and make that a priority for our litigation and even figuring out how to access courts because a lot of the courts simply shut down for a minute. They stopped allowing public access to trials or to other hearings, which violates folks' rights. So there was a lot of emergency things that we had to immediately shift and respond to because of the moment that we're in. And that's still kind of ongoing. So we have both kind of our North Star big goals that we want to reach and help that prioritize our work on a regular basis. But we always try to respond to emergency things when we know that we have the power to do so. So um, just sort of picking up on that thread, um, you don't. You guys have clients, but you're really issue. Um, you really have issues that you represent, and um, so how how does that play into how you operate? And especially when it comes to funding, right? The issues aren't paying the bills. Uh, someone else is paying the bills. So working for a nonprofit and getting funding, how much does the funding dictate how how, uh, how you know your work? Uh, which issues you focus on and how you how you um, how you uh, further them. Um, Alyssa. That's some hard hitting questions. <laughs> uh, we are a nonprofit. We are funded by donors. Um, a lot of people know the ACLU name and brand. And like during times of political unrest, definitely during the last four years with Trump in office, people wanted to donate more to our organization. They wanted to join our chapters where individual residents can be a chapter member and they do a lot of like local advocacy, public comments and support of things that align with what the organization is doing. But the board of directors for our organization does set out some really large overarching goals of what they like us to see or accomplish or areas that they'd want us to do more work in or to build out a whole new unit. Like we're strengthening some of our legislative office staff to do more work at the state level. So they'll set some larger guiding principles that does kind of shift our work or again, affect maybe where we build out our staffing that we don't necessarily have control over, but does determine kind of what resources we have to do our advocacy with. Um, the, you know, our donors themselves you know they're donating to our mission which is to protect and preserve civil rights and civil liberties so we have a lot of leeway in just our general mission so i'd say the board has more control over kind of setting out more specific parameters of what types of advocacy or issue areas um, and then we kind of find clients that fit into what our vision and goals have already been set so a lot of it's limited retainers again it's class actions and impact litigation that we don't have you know, regular clients, but we do have regular partners that we might work with or regular media, especially for like our public records act cases that many of them started with a media agency who requested records. So we partner with them to help enforce that because the media group may not have any lawyers or any legal knowledge to really enforce their request, but they need those records so they can do public reporting, which benefits all of us. Um, so I'd say budget is always a big thing, but we are fortunate that people kind of want to donate to civil rights and civil liberties orgs in this season um, from what I've experienced in the last year of being at ACLU. Um, so it doesn't necessarily limit us, but it's more the board's direction of where they'd like us to prioritize our resources. Uh, thank you, uh, Avi. Uh, um, like ACLU, we are a large group and we got funding from a variety of sources. So we have foundation funding, which may uh, support a specific body of work, a specific project, uh, something very targeted, but we also have 
both small individual donors and large individual donors, people who are donating 35 bucks a year to people who are donating millions uh, potentially. Um, and so it's, you know, some of that funding is very directed at particular pieces of work and some of it just supports the general work of the organization. And uh, as, as I alluded to earlier, you know, NRDC has certain priority categories of work and the, that the specific work within those large categories is decided by a combination of staff and taking into account partners' considerations, whether it be frontline communities or um, coalition partners or whatever the case may be, using that to inform our decision-making process, um, along with staff's own um, knowledge and understanding of the issues. So, you know, it's funding can dictate to some degree, especially when you're talking about like foundation grants, which are funding a particular piece of project, you put in a proposal, they fund that, that's what you work on, but that's not the sole source of funding and the institution supports other areas of work that are prioritized in our planning process. Okay, great. I'm going to ask one more quick question and turn it over to the students. I'm sure they have some questions too. Um, so if you were going to say like the two things that you just love the most about your job, like if you're going to try to convince someone, you have to come take this job because A and B. Uh, and then the two things that are just, that really get to you about your job, like you're going to tell this other person, you really don't want this job because of X and Y. So, um, so Avi, let's start with you. Uh, I get to make a difference every day in the world. At least that's the way it feels. It, it's really gratifying. It's it's great to be able to do that. And it's work that I really enjoy too. You know, it's like problem solving. You try to look at a pe something that's not working and you try to figure out what will help fix it. And you, then you got to go out and help do it. And um, that's just really awesome. Uh, I, I love that aspect of my work. Um, and, you know, a place like NRDC, you have to, tools of, uh, available to you depending on the problem. Some things, you already have a good law out there, you got to go litigate. We can work with our litigation team to go do that. Other things, the laws that are on the books and not doing a good enough job or not being implemented correctly, you, you engage in the administrative context. We have the capacity to do that. We have the support to do that. We have scientists on staff who can engage with the scientific underpinnings. If it's something that hasn't been addressed yet by law, you can go try to make changes to laws and get that done. Um, and that's really, you know, that, that sense is really, that ability to make change is really wonderful about this job. The frustrating thing about the job is, you know, it's not always easy to make this progress. It's often very difficult. Things can take years. Case can be in the courts for over a decade. I just recently, we got a really got a case that was filed before my 11 year old was born. And she was like, how long have you been doing this? Um, you know, so that, that's the kind of thing. An issue can be in the, in the legislature for years and years and years. Look at climate change, what's been happening nationally and how long that's been sitting out there, even though we need immediate action, right? Um, and the power of industry is pretty tremendous. You know, we've constantly having to go up and make arguments where you might get a particular rationale, but you know that's not what I play, what's at play necessarily uh, on some of these issues. And that can be incredibly frustrating. But I think you have to keep reminding, you know, for me, it's always reminding myself that um, change is possible and that, you know, while it may be slow uh, sometimes, if you, uh, if you expect the worst and hope for the best and, and can help make progress, that goes a long way. So, Thank you. Uh, Alyssa, good and bad. Um. I'll start with the bad, maybe. <laughs> um, I think one of the bad things is, you know, we're doing civil rights and social justice work, and there are people who are invested in the status quo. There are people who benefit from people being excluded from injustice. Um, definitely people who benefit from things like incarceration. And so there are a lot of hate attacks on our office, on what we stand for, on our organization as a whole. Even while we've been um, sheltered in place for the last year, there have been vandalisms and attacks at our physical office space in San Francisco. So we have to constantly talk about security and safety of the staff, of our building, of our clients even. Um, so it is kind of heightened level that I have not experienced in other workplaces because we are such a well-known organization, but again, there's many people who don't like the work that we're doing who don't want us to make progress on the issues. Um, 
So I would say that's one of the major negatives. Um, I guess the other is just kind of the, all the internal bureaucracy. Again, we have a national structure, we have affiliate structures, we have legislative teams, organizing teams. If you come from really small practice or from small schools, it might be a lot to just figure out where everyone is. For me, it was kind of hard because we went on shelter in place a month after I started. So I was just figuring out the office building and like how to get to my office and where my boss's office was. And so it's been a little more challenging with just such a large organization and many different moving parts and affiliated parts of ACLU to put everyone in place and understand how they all work together. So it is kind of a learning curve on just the internal portion. I'll say the positives are, um, you know, having multiple forms of advocacy, not just doing litigation, not just doing policy or legislation, but having all of them, having staff that are special specialists and experts in those areas. Even if I'm not doing legislation, I can jump into the legislative team's meeting and say, oh, here's all the criminal justice or policing bills coming up. And so to have those things at my disposal to help me work with or to refer our partners to is really great and is unique. Um, to doing kind of more traditional litigation or firm work. And I would say the work-life balance. <laughs> I came from private practice, was in court every day, had filings. So that was, you know, working till deadlines at midnight and then prepping to go to a hearing the next morning. So it was a lot more fast paced having to move to court deadlines and that we weren't necessarily in control of. So litigation docket was a lot harder just on my time and, um, and yeah, my balance with work and my other things going on. So I think nonprofit allows me to manage my hours more. And again, it's not as heavy on one type of advocacy. So it's spread out and it's more of a flow of the workload than things always being on go, like if you're in trial season. So I would say those are my too bad, too good. Those are great. Um, so I'm going to- that um, one. Yeah. 